Hello, my name's Oliver Kahn. I'm a Times leader writer and columnist. I have written a book called Mending the Mind, The Art and Science of Overcoming Clinical Depression. The book is available from fine retailers through the post or, or through ebook form and um, will be available in the shops once they reopen, hopefully soon. So could you explain what it was that led you to realise that you were seriously depressed? The difference between feeling low and being clinically depressed is huge. And it was the distinction between those two states of mind that caused me to realise that there was something very seriously wrong. Everyone feels low moods at times. It's part of the stuff of life. We all have disappointments and thwarted ambitions and great sadnesses at times, um, marital relationship, discord or breakup and, and bereavement. And it's perfectly natural to feel sad when these things happen. Um, my uh, state of depression was in the first instance stimulated by a long period of loneliness and disappointment in various aspects of my life, but nothing that you would count as tragic, nothing like the sort of experience that friends of mine have been to who've suffered oppression and, and witnessed the genocide of their communities in countries like Bosnia. Um, my uh, domesticity was, in my mind, um, unsuccessful. My personal relationships I felt I had failed in, whereas at the same time my professional life was prominent and, and successful. And this sort of mismatch of my belief in what I was accomplishing professionally and what I was failing to accomplish in personal life caused intense loneliness. And one day when I was out in central London, um, I suddenly suffered a really extreme loss of memory. I could not remember my own home address and it wouldn't come back. Uh, as long as I thought about it. And that was when I realized that something was wrong. Uh, I didn't call it clinical depression because the term didn't mean anything to me. I had the idea that depression is, is sadness, is just real and prolonged sadness. Um, but that's what prompted me to realize that something was badly wrong. When I eventually got home, I went to bed and lay under the covers for 24 hours in a state of great mental anguish and that was the moment at which I realized that something was badly wrong. And who did you turn to to get help initially? In the first instance I contacted my friends. I sent them an email that was somewhat, and some close friends uh, who might known for very many years, I sent them an email that was somewhat incoherent and they um, on receiving it, they um, remarked to themselves, so they've later told me, that they'd never um, had that sort of communication from me before. And in the first instance, um, my remarkable friends looked after me, um, had me to stay for part of every week because they realised I was not in a fit state of mind. Um, but nothing, nothing I did could shake not only the blackness that had enveloped me psychologically, but cognitive beliefs that were, to anyone um, looking from the outside, made no sense at all. I was convinced that I was evil, and, um, and, and this was weighing on me to a, uh, an extreme degree. When I realised that my work was severely suffering. Um, I couldn't accomplish my professional tasks at all. Um, I talked to my employer and they insisted, um, gently insisted, that I get a medical diagnosis. And when I went to see the doctor, um, he immediately um, diagnosed it as severe depression on listening to my symptoms, which were extensive and really classically textbook symptoms of mental disorder. And that was when I realised that I I had a clinical illness. It wasn't just um, something akin to low mood or, or sadness. And um, I determined to get treatment and to find out about treatments. When you say you, you uh, had a series of symptoms, can you give us some idea of the sort of things that uh, meant that you were 
are diagnosed as clinically depressed? Yes. There are a number of symptoms that are part of the diagnostic manuals for mental disorder. The difficulty with mental disorder is that, uh, as a medical diagnosis, is that whereas it's obvious when someone is suffering from a physical illness, um, because it's directly observable, whether to the naked eye or, or through X-ray, you can you can look at directly the um, the uh, uh, the consequences of disease. Um, with mental disorder, we only know these maladies by their symptoms. We don't know what causes them. Um, there are plenty of theories, um, but no definitive uh, identifiable cause for clinical depression or other disorders of mood. But symptoms are consistent. They're consistent across cases and across generations and epochs. Um, and the main symptoms are uh, a crushing low mood that isn't dispelled, whatever you do, or however long you, you try to uh, think your way out of it. Um, very often, feelings of extreme guilt and anguish, uh, continual thoughts of death, especially they're not always by suicide, and physical behaviours. It's very often accompanied by rapid weight loss through a loss of physical appetite and, or occasionally um, rapid weight gain, um, the phenomenon of eating because it is something to do. Um, and other um, physical symptoms, um, extreme agitation or alternatively listlessness. Um, your, your, not only your weight is often changed, but your appearance, you look haggard, um, uh, your gait is changed, you move sluggishly. It is not obvious to you suffering it, but it is obvious to those who know you, to friends and colleagues, who, and sometimes even complete strangers who realize that there is something wrong. Um, so they are symptoms, but they're not a, a grab bag of, um, uh, of invented uh, phenomena. They are real symptoms, directly observed, which all lead to a diagnosis of clinical depression, if there are enough of them, and if they persist over time. And you had experience of, of um, using medication. Could you talk a bit about that? I had experience of medication. That was the first port of call for um, treatment. Um, when I went to see a doctor who diagnosed me very expertly and very sympathetically very early, he explained uh, the treatments that were available. I had already tried uh, seeing a, um, a psychotherapist, what's known as a dynamic psychotherapist, and had not found it a helpful experience. I don't want to uh, engage in any sort of um, blame for it. I'm sure I was a difficult um, patient to work with. And I do firmly believe that this form of psychotherapy, which goes into a patient's past memories and tries to uncover the key to their uh, present mental uh, disturbance, I do think that there are some uh, mental conditions for which it is helpful. It's particularly helpful in a form um, known as object relations theory, which um, is um, uh, which stresses the need to form good relationships. I mean, it sounds a, a, a truism, but it, it, it's really important for the many very ill people who psychiatrists see in the NHS who may never have had a positive relationship in their lives, may have been neglected or abused as children and never been able to form relationships since. So I'm not decrying that importance, but it didn't work for me with my mood disorder. It did not work at all. It just intensified my sense of guilt. When I saw the doctor and told him about this experience, he recommended two courses. One was antidepressant medication, and the other was a different form of psychological therapy. And the medication, because it could be instantly obtained on prescription, was my first point of call in trying to get better. Um, two forms of medication. One um, was 
sedatives because I was sleeping so badly and, and was terrified through the night. And the other was uh, a, a very common form of antidepressant medication, uh, SSRIs, and specifically the type known as fluoxetine, whose uh, well, that's its um, uh, brand name that's more commonly known as Prozac. And I started taking those. Mm -hmm. And and then you uh, your experience of CBT was successful and positive. Could you talk a bit about that? Yes, the psychological therapy that I had was cognitive behavioural therapy or CBT. I turned up for my first appointment to the consulting room, and the clinical psychologist uh, who I met, who was much younger than I'd supposed. Um, she was, um, uh, I guess, in her early to mid-30s. And um, uh, I had the idea that um, uh, a psychologist or a psychotherapist would ideally have a few grey hairs reflecting their experience of life. And, um, but I was quite wrong. Um, the clinical psychologist had the... CBT doesn't need to be practiced by a clinical psychologist. It can be done by, um, by a, a psychotherapist or, or indeed anyone. You can do it by computer. Um, but it was very helpful to me to meet someone who was expert, who was amply qualified with a doctorate in clinical psychology and a great deal of NHS clinical experience and who had a sympathetic personality, which um, is not essential, but very helpful for effective treatment. And the techniques of CBT, and not only CBT, but allied therapies, which she also explained to me, one in particular known as compassion-focused therapy, they don't rely on an exhaustive trawl of a patient's early memories, which is the basis for sort of Freudian approach that gave rise to psychoanalysis and whose residue you still find in psychodynamic therapy. The essence of CBT is the conviction that mental disturbance depends not on the events that cause us sadness. We all have events that cause us sadness, but not everyone, fortunately, is clinically depressed as a result of them. Depression arises not from the events, but the interpretations we place on them. And the clinical psychologist, whose name is Dr. O'Connor, uh, whom I uh, refer to in the book, explained to me the approach, and we conversed, we talked. It's rather different from the approach of psychodynamic therapy, where essentially the patient talks open-endedly, and the therapist will typically um, inquire about um, a patient's past life and look for a key to their present mental disorder um, and try to investigate what has caused it. Um, there's no sort of trawling through distant memories in CBT. It's a process of inquiry and conversation about what is happening now and identifying the cognitive distortions that have given rise to clinical depression. If I may give you an example, um, something that happens to very many people, if not all of us, is disappointment in love, marital or relationship problems, and sometimes uh, breakups that are, that are very harsh indeed. This is always distressing to anyone. If you've invested hopes and emotions and loves and dreams of growing old with someone. This is always distressing. Um, and the sadness may give rise to a reinforcing cycle of negative thoughts, things like, how could this happen when I thought we were perfectly matched? What did I fail to see um, in this uh, relationship that led to the breakup? Um, uh, I am at fault. Uh, I was negligent, I can never be happy again. All of these things can sort of turn round and round in your mind, create a cycle of catastrophizing, that things are much, much worse than they can actually, uh, than, than they actually are, and lead to clinical illness. 
um, CBT doesn't um, have answers. It doesn't um, tell you, oh, don't be so silly. Of course you'll get over it. That's not a helpful response at all. It is to intervene and suggest that while the sadness may be very great now, um, the interpretation you put on the event may be causing clinical illness and a, a practical response to breakup of a relationship that causes great sadness is to say to yourself, well, yes, it is very harsh. It is very hard. I am very sad and very distressed. I won't always feel this way. Um, and merely to introduce that qualification to the way you feel may curb that catastrophizing instinct and train your thoughts better. And that's just a, a single example. Mm. Um, but the the um, the ability to stop this constant cycle of negative thinking is absolutely crucial to the treatment. And my experience is that it, it does work very well indeed. How do you feel now? I feel... I, it, it will sound as if I overstate this, uh, but it is genuinely the case that while I would never have wished to go through the experience of clinical depression, I feel, and wouldn't wish it on anyone, I feel that the experience and the treatment have changed my life for good in both senses. I feel I have become a wiser person, not as a result of the clinical depression, but as, the resu as a result of the effective treatment that I received for it. It's because we know so little about the causes of mental disorder. We know so little about the physical organ that gives rise to thoughts and emotions and, and, and cognitions. Um, we can't say with any certainty that um, we know of a, of a cure for it. Uh, and we can't say with any certainty that someone who suffers from it won't have a reoccurrence of the condition. But I do feel that if I ever slip back into a depressive state of thinking later in life, I will know what to do. Um, I have been trained in the methods of self-protection that to me are equivalent to a cure. Um, I can't say with certainty that it won't happen to me again, but I will know what to do when it does, if it does. What are your thoughts about the... Um about the lockdown, the COVID pandemic, the the the, the, the sort of mood of, of people in general. Do you sense that there will be uh, more people struggling with their mental health because of it? We are talking 10 months into the greatest public health crisis for more than a century since the influenza pandemic of 1918 to 1920 and the remedial measures adopted to deal with it include isolation necessarily that's absolutely necessary to curb the, the spread of infection but it will have is having an effect on mental health it cannot but do so when we are all worried for the future. We're worried about the health of ourselves and our loved ones. And many people are worried about their livelihoods and their jobs. It cannot but have a destructive effect on mental health. That does not mean that there's any easy route out of it. I'm absolutely convinced that there's no reasonable response to um, the global pandemic other than to stop the spread of transmission um, and to curb social interaction. Um, but it will have an effect on mental health. By the way, if we just allowed COVID to spread and did not have the lockdown, that would have an impact on mental health too. Um, medical experts know much more about COVID now. And they know that it's a multi-system illness that can have a direct neurological impact. There have been reports of seizures and confusion. And uh, one study by Oxford University researchers finds that COVID survivors, those who have long COVID, are more at risk of developing mental disorder. So there's no easy route out of this, even supposing lockdown were not necessarily uh, on grounds of um, curving transmission, which it is. Um, uh, it would still have a very big impact on mental health. And we do know from the experience that I referred to, the 1918-1920 influenza pandemic, that in that case, there was a big rise in the incidence of psychiatric disorders 
um, in the wake of it. And I expect and fear that the same will be true with the COVID pandemic of 2020-2021. Um, my message is um, there are effective treatments. Uh, we don't know enough about mood disorders, but we do know the things that work, not for everyone, but for most people, most of the time, we know the treatments that work better than just allowing the passage of time to heal. And it's very important that people do get treatment.